Well, hi, everybody. I'm Philip Shields. Welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm glad you can join us. At first, I want to remind you that some of you may not be aware of it if you're new to this site, that I use the Hebrew name for Jesus. I use the name that his mama would have called him, which is Yeshua, the Hebrew name for Jesus. Many of you know that already, but just in case, so if I say Jesus or if I say Yeshua, I have nothing wrong. I have nothing against saying Jesus. I'm not, I'm not like that, but, but I, I, I like the name that a person's called by their mom. And that was a name that the angels gave her to call him. And today's going to be part two, the final part for God's perfection in us, God's way. And if you haven't heard part one, please hear that, watch that first. Though I will do a review and I'll review some of the things we said part one, I'm going to be also infiltrating and injecting some new material as well. Uh, so we need to understand why do we have to talk about, why? Why do we have to talk about becoming perfect? Well, number one, God's preparing a team, a very special team of first fruits. It's a very high calling. And he's calling people that the world rejects. He's calling people the world doesn't think very much of so that he can show what he can do with what, he, what, what we bring to the table. We're not the greats of the world. We're not. But he's going to use the first fruits people in the first resurrection to set up the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua, when he comes back. And those in the first resurrection will be his assistants. And we have to be like him in his image, in the image of, of Christ, and who is also in the image of God. We have to be like he is, people who are holy, people who are complete, perfect. We talked about that some last time. So, so many scriptures call the saints. A saint just means the called out holy ones, you know, the holy ones. Uh, holy and righteous, just like God, perfect. We have to all be on the same mindset. And it's a very high calling. I hope you get excited about it. Number two, uh, Yeshua taught us this. Uh, he says to be on that team, you must therefore be perfect uh, in, in Matthew 5, 48. And uh, we also covered last time how Yeshua is the only one who has ever lived perfectly. The only one. Don't buy into the idea that there are others. No, no, it's only Yeshua. There's no other name given under heaven by which we may be saved. He's the only one. And then he, in turn, we become part of him. And by being part of him, who, and it says in Colossians 3, 3, uh, that he, we are in him, our new life, and he, in turn, is in God. So we are also in God by being in Christ. Colossians 3, 3 explains it. And, th and verse 4. So become perfect. Be perfect. And I'm hoping this topic number three will rekindle uh, an excitement for the things of God in many of you, many of us. I feel there's a sense of doldrums and discouragement and blasé attitude. What's so? What's the big deal? Uh, the latest see and I'm okay attitude. I'm rich and increased with goods and need of nothing. That's flowing through the church of God right now. Yeshua doesn't like it. He wants us to know that we can and must be relying on him. He also tells us in Revelation 2, and the, 2 and 3 are the, are the letters, the, the messages to the seven churches. And he says to the Ephesus church, and remember he, says, remember he says to listen to all the messages to all the churches. And so in Revelation 2, I think it's verse 4 and 5, he says, you have left your first love. You're not as excited as you used to be. I want you to get back to that first love, that excitement when you were first being called. And now many of you also uh, know we're supposed to become more and more like God. And part of this excitement that I'm hoping can be built again is that too many times I do, and I'm sure you do, feel like a total failure. You look at the way things are happening around you or your relationships with certain ones or, or things you've been thinking about that weren't right, actions you've done that aren't right, and yet you're a child of God having the Holy Spirit. And yet you know we don't measure up to perfection yet. At least I can admit that. I'm sure you can too. In fact, I think a lot of people get discouraged because we know we're not uh, ex exhibiting the, the love of God the way we should. And so therefore we're not, we're, we're missing out on the joy 
of salvation. At the end of David's prayer in Psalm 51, he says, I want that joy of your salvation back. And so let's do a quick overview. Um, first of all, what does perfect mean? You shall be perfect. In our English language, it means flawless, nothing, nothing marring it. But in the Greek, the New Testament was written in the Greek originally, and the word there is teleo. I think it's, oh, I don't, I don't think I put the number down, 5548 or something like that in the, in the, arms, in, in the, in the Strong's Concordance. And anyway, in the Greek, it, it can mean flawless, referring to God and the things of God, but certainly many, many times, especially in context, it means to mature, to be complete, to be matured, finished, uh, attaining the goal. Uh, it, it, it can mean all of those things. So when you see other translations taking the word perfect as it's used in King James and New King James, you'll often see that they use the word mature, finished, accomplished, or done with it, or whatever, you know. So we also, last time, understand that God calls and speaks of the things yet to come as if they've already happened because he can create that future like an architect. I, I mentioned how that architect, and he has... There, uh, there's a vacant lot with just rocks and trees and dirt, and he knows he's going to put a beautiful opera house there with beautiful landscaping. He knows exactly every detail of that building, and he knows it's going to be accomplished because he's going to make sure it gets done. That's a human being who can speak as if it's already done. Here's what it's going to look like. God can already say how we are going to look like because he knows that he's going to accomplish what he has said he's going to do. And that's what Isaiah 46, verse 10 and 11 definitely say. So this is how God can say right now that he's already made you perfect because he's speaking from the end result looking back. Okay? He's going to get you to that point. He is going to get you to that point by Christ, Yeshua, living mightily inside of us. If we let him, if we open the door, if we seek him, let him live in us. So that's how he can say in Hebrews 10, verse 14, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Past tense, past tense, has perfected. And who's doing it? He is, God is, Christ is. And how long is this perfection going to last? Forever, from the time that he starts to work with you to the end. All right, the road to perfection. Let's talk about it, um, how we get there. The road to perfection in Christ Jesus starts with God the Father, God Most High. God Most High looked down and he picked you, and I'm beginning to think he may have had you in mind, some of us, some of you, maybe all of us, in mind even before we were born. And he was arranging certain marriages together to come out with the person he wants. Now, not that you're some big deal or I'm some big deal. We're the nobodies of the world. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. We're the nobodies of the world. We know that. But so he calls you first. And um, John 6, 44 is very clear on that. And we need to learn to cherish this high calling and really love it. Be, feel so blessed to, to be part of the invitation, to be part of the wedding supper of the Lamb. The certain king, God the Father, putting on this wedding for his son. You know, Matthew 22, verses 1 to 10. So we accept God's calling. And if you haven't yet, why on earth haven't you? What, what's holding you back? So what God then does, according to John, John 6, 44, says God calls us. In John 6, 37 and 45, uh, God then hands us over to Yeshua, to his son, to, to, to work with us. And then what does he do? He in turn, John 14, 6, he in turn will now reveal the Father to us. And he, he, he leads us back to the Father, reveals the Father. And God leads us to repentance. And uh, the, the goodness of God leads us to repentance, Romans 2, 4 says. And so we have to turn from the old way that we were going and go into God's way now. And accept and in repentance, receive the washing of the, of the, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away all our sins, every single sin we've ever committed. And frankly, at that point, when you accept him as your Savior, he continues to cleanse, continues to wash. One of those verses in 1 John 1, I think it's verse 8, and he cleanses. It's an ongoing action. 
because we continue to still sin from time to time. So he will continue to cleanse us, not just one time. It's an ongoing washing by the blood. It's a very high calling. And if we accept Yeshua as our Savior, there are many verses that say we actually pass from death into life. And uh, John 3, 35, 36, and, and he takes the wrath of, of God on our sins, on, on us because of our sins. But if we don't accept him, if we dilly-dally around with that, then the wrath of God still applies to us. John 3, 36. We covered some of those last time. So we're called to repent, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul said, Peter said, on the day of Pentecost. Now, you do have to receive the Holy Spirit. And that's God's presence in us. There's no way that we can ever expect to attain perfection without it. In fact, Paul says to the Galatians, in Galatians 3, 3, Paul says to the Galatians, Oh, foolish Galatians, he says, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect, perfect by the flesh? The NIV says, Are you going to attain the goal by, again, perfect can mean attain the goal, mature, finish. Are you going to be finished, attain the goal by, hum by your human effort? So, anyway, so... Um, God now gives us the Holy Spirit. Christ comes live in our hearts. Ephesians 3, 17. Yes, that's what it says. He now lives in our hearts by his Spirit. And he intends to live in you the way he lived in the, the way he lived the first time. When he was walking the earth obediently, respectfully, seeking God's will. We have to change by letting Christ be in us, work in us mightily. That takes constantly seeking after him that requires that okay and we'll read first and and also you know we got god, god should be seeing much more of yeshua's obedience yeshua's attitudes in our lives day by day as we grow closer to his coming um and he, god even says in first john 2 verses 3 to 6 that you can claim to know him but if you don't keep his commandments you're a liar you're a liar so we'll talk more about that as we go along. Now, if we continue to sin willfully, if we continue to sin willfully, according to the old nature, according to breaking God's commandments, and we don't go to God's way of life, we will die. Now, Romans 8, 11 talks about how God will give us life through that Holy Spirit. And then verse 12, Therefore, brothers... We have an obligation. I'm reading from the NIV here. We have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it, the flesh. You're not, you cannot continue to be the way you were. You need to understand I'm preaching that, but I'm also preaching the incredible grace of God as well in this, in this process of being perfected. Verse 13, For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. Is that clear? So I am not teaching that as God takes and washes us away and brings us into Christ that we can continue living the way we did. We cannot. We cannot. In fact, I think it's in Matthew 7, uh, verses 21 to 23, where he says, it's not those who say, Lord, Lord, who are going to be there. He says, in fact, many will come and say, Lord, didn't we in your name cast out demons and did do wonderful miracles? And then he'll say, get away from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity, you, work, you workers of lawlessness. Never knew you. All right? So this is a very serious calling, a very high calling. We have to obey God. If you walk according to the sinful nature, Romans 8, 13, you will die. We have to put to death the misdeeds of the body. If you do that, verse 13, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons or children of God. Titus 1.16 says, in fact, that we can claim to know him and yet be denying him by the way we live, by our works. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, disqualified for every good work. Frankly, our hard work, the good works are things we do to help people, the good things and all that, sure. But the, the focus of our work, I really think, is shown by Yeshua himself in John 14, verses uh, 4 and 5. Abide in me, stick like glue to me, 
like glue, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. You can't cut off a branch and leave it there beside the tree or vine. It, you come back a couple days later, it's all dead. Neither can you unless you stick like glue to me. I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He means nothing spiritually. Without me, you can do nothing. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? Because that's God in us. That's Christ in us. And when God gives us his Holy Spirit, it also gives us his seed, his divine nature. 1 Peter 1, verses 2 to 4 and verse 23, we'll put it on the side there. His power, it gives us his power. It gives us his very nature, his seed, his DNA, if you will. Part of God himself is coming into us. And they come to live inside of us by the Holy Spirit. John 14, 23 says, We will come, Father and I, Yeshua says, will come and make our abode in you. We will come live in you. Because those of us who are led by the Holy Spirit are those who are children of God. We just read that in Romans 8, 14 earlier. Remember also that God is the one who qualifies us. First, in Colossians 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, For he has qualified us. You're not the one going to be qualifying yourself for the kingdom. God qualifies you in Christ, in you. You've got to get the concept of in Christ, in him. So, NIV says, For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy, remember that's Hebrews 10, 14. In God's, it's God's work. It's, it's not your work. And uh, if we don't understand that God credits, shares his righteousness, gives us his righteousness, imputes his righteousness, credits his righteousness. It's like a bank statement, crediting. Okay, he removes everything bad we have, and then he puts in everything good he has. We talked about Philippians 3 that I don't want the, my own righteousness from the law. I don't want my righteousness from the law. I want the righteousness from God, Philippians 3, 9 to 11 says. From God, through Jesus Christ, by faith. And I want to get to know him and the power of his resurrection, Christ's resurrection. What does he mean by that? I want Christ's resurrection to live, his resurrection life to live inside of me the way he lived before, seeking God's will. Now, Romans 4, verses 21 to 25, I'll use the NIV again here. In talking about how Abraham believed God, that even as old as he was, he was going to have a child. And as old as his wife Sarah was, she's going to have a child. Because he believed God, let's post that up there now, Romans 4, verses 21 to 25, because he believed God, it was imputed, it was credited to him for righteousness. And it was credited to him, was written not just for him alone, verse 23, but also for us. Sorry, I'm talking so fast, but I have to because there's so much to cover. Also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. Also to us to whom God will credit righteousness. Now, then in 2 Corinthians 5.21, this is a, such a beautiful verse. We must understand this verse if we're going to understand perfection. For he, God, made him, that's Christ, who knew no sin. He never sinned. To be sin for us. Take all the other verses about how he takes our sins upon himself and John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He took them on himself and takes them away. Who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So God says, let me have everything you have that you've done, all the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. Now that you're cleaned up, reformatted, <laughs> Now that you're reformatted, cleaned up, I can put myself now into you. And so that now when I look at you, I see the perfect son of mine. And you are in him. I see you as righteous, covered by my righteousness, the righteousness of God by faith through Christ. 
got to understand that. God imputes to us all of God imputes all of our sins to Christ, and then he imputes to us all of his perfect righteousness. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. Now, as we abide in him, in Christ, we have to understand that we still have sins that seem to hang on, and we need to come to God, we need to come to Christ, and say, I'm having trouble with some old patterns of life. And I know I just can't seem to overcome them. They, they keep hanging on. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, we can. And so what you do in your prayer is you admit in prayer, Lord, I can't seem to defeat certain wrong concepts, attitudes, and actions, and thoughts, and weaknesses. But I know you can, Yeshua. I know you can. I'm asking you to fight those inside of me. Overcome them with me, inside of me. Okay, so this repentance and turning to God has to be complete, holding nothing back. He's now our Lord and Master Yeshua. Is the transformation now, though, is Christ living in us, okay? And he is the one transforming you. You're not transforming yourself. He's the one transforming you. So Yeshua uh, himself was perfected by things that he lived through and suffered. And we I want to review that again, Hebrews 2.10 it is fitting for him and by whom are all things and, and, and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation, that's Yeshua, perfect through sufferings. Perfect through sufferings. Yeshua, the Son of God. Now, wasn't he already flawless? Wasn't he already perfect? I think he was. But this is an example where maybe the other translations of this word teleo would be make more sense. He was completed. He was finished. He was completed. Help us understand better. He was already perfect, as we understand the word, but not yet complete. So last time I explained how by becoming a human being and living as a human being for more than three decades, that he began to understand. So this is what we created, what it's really like when you're one of them, not just created by me, but now I am one, like a human. And so to be high priest with deep, deep empathy required that, and that completed him complete. Wonderful. Now, on top of the sufferings he went through, not only that, but Hebrews 4, verse 15 and 16, he had to understand what, we're, what we go through when we're tempted to do the wrong thing, to think the wrong thing, to go the wrong places. Hebrews 4, verse 15 and 16 he was. He was. He had to go through all of that. And I'm sure Satan was doing his best to put the worst temptations into Christ. We think of him as being so perfect and so holy and he's the son of God. There's no way he'd ever be tempted to lie, ever be tempted to break the Sabbath, ever be tempted to lust, ever be tempted to commit fornication or to kill somebody or to steal. Well, let's read it. Hebrews 4, verse 15 and 16. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let's therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, because he understands. He was tempted in all points like we are. Like to admit it or not, or think of him that way or not, the temptation, understand, the temptation is not the sin. Yeshua was tempted to hate. He was tempted to lust. He was tempted to break the Sabbath. He was tempted to commit fornication, to lie, to steal, in all points, to get discouraged, to give up, to give up. He says at one point, I'm, I'm so anxious and troubled by what's about to happen, even unto death, he says. I feel like, I think just as he got into the Garden of Gethsemane is when he said something like that. He was tempted. He overcame the temptations, resisted them, and beat them. And beat them. So he understands how hard it is sometimes to always fight and win over sin. He never gave in. So therefore, 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2 says, therefore, we have an advocate. We have a defense attorney. That's what it means, a defense attorney on our side who went through all these temptations, all these sufferings, and so he is defending you before God. 
1 John 2, 1 and 2, if, you haven't, if you're not familiar with the scripture, you should read it. So going through all the suffering he did, going through all the temptations he did, prepared him, completed him to be the high priest for all of us. Now, remember what I said, how that word teleo can mean different things. Remember on the cross, Yeshua, when it says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, John 19, 30. John 19, 30. He said, finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit, his spirit. Finished. It's the same Greek word there, teleo. Same Greek word. He could have just as easily said, done, or perfect, or perfectly done. Because that, again, by that point, he was done. He was finished. And it was done perfectly. He used the very same word, teleo, that we've been using. So our God and King now understands what it's like to be human and to beat it without ever once failing. He is perfect. He is complete. He is flawless in his case. Now he shifts the focus on back to you. So now we're also being perfected just like he was. And just like he did, we have to be perfected by the things we go through in this life. So everything you're going through in life, good and bad and ugly, everything you're going through in life, God's involved in everything in us. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows when a sparrow falls and dies. He knows exactly what we're going through. He knows our thoughts while we're still in bed. He knows our thoughts. I think Psalm 139 talks about that, that wherever we go, he's there. So in the same way that Yeshua was completed by suffering, Hebrews 2.10, we just read it, we also are being perfected by suffering. So don't think that God's not answering your prayers for healing or for the pain to diminish, if your pain isn't diminishing. It could well be that God is saying, okay, I'm going to let you keep going through this suffering because it's building something in you that you wouldn't otherwise have. It's building something in you. And we're being prepared to be priests. Christ is the high priest. We're being prepared to be the royal priesthood. You know the verses in 1 Peter 2, 9 or whatever it is. I'm, that may not be it, but, but a royal priesthood. So we grow and prepare for that by the things which we're suffering and by resisting temptations, by resisting temptations that we face. And now Christ in us is resisting in us, overcoming temptations again. We need to follow his lead. Those who are led by the Spirit are children of God. If you have these thoughts, hey, don't go there, don't say that, don't be that way, be this way instead. That's Yeshua talking to you. You got to listen. Got to listen. But don't think that because of all these sufferings I'm going through and everything going wrong, something must be terribly wrong. I mean, look at the man Paul, probably the greatest apostle. I mean, look at John the Baptist. He got beheaded. But the apostle Paul, you would have thought God would give him a break and not have him suffer so much. But he was being prepared for some very high calling, some very high position. And so he was shipwrecked three times, beaten with rods, with big sticks three times. That must have hurt. He was flogged and scourged five times, 39 lashes. Each time, that's I think 195 total lashes by the Jews. And he had assassination attempts. He had to fight beasts in Ephesus. He was stoned and left for dead. He was shipwrecked and left in the water for a day and a half. I mean, he could have very easily thought, how come you're not answering my prayers? You follow what I'm saying? God could have spared him all that trouble, but then neither would Paul have grown and, and, and been prepared for what God is preparing for him. I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. So Paul goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18, this time I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, and he calls these just light afflictions. I wonder what a heavy affliction would be. <laughs> so, and Paul, in, in fact, before we read this one, I'll just mention, he says in Romans 8, 18, that, that the, the things we go through now cannot be, the sufferings we go through now cannot be, aren't worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. 
Now in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18, therefore we don't lose heart, even though by the outward man is perishing. I'm dying, he said. I'm getting old. I'm getting beat up. The inward man is being renewed day by day for, for our light affliction. Verse 17, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things not seen are eternal. He says, sure, you're going through a lot, but please understand, suffering's part of the program. James 1, verses 2 to 4, we'll put it up there. And if you're going through a lot, God may be preparing you, like he did Paul, like he did John the Baptist, like he did his own son, for the very high calling, and you, suffering is part of it. Suffering is part of it. I have a good friend named Paul Gibson, and he has MS. He can't move anything below his neck. Keep praying for him, but I just have a really strong notion that God in heaven is preparing Paul for something very high and beautiful. Paul does a lot of things. I don't want to talk about just Paul. That's Paul Gibson, but, but he's doing a lot of things to keep people alive. And God's going to bless him for that. There are others that do that as well. God will bless you as well that you're doing things like that. Now in James 1, verses 2 to 4, Brethren, I count it all joy. You, you need to count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Peter said it's, it's worth more than a, than a bar of gold. He said that your trials, which are better than, a, than, a, than gold, because it's, it's worth more, what it does for all eternity. And so that's what Peter says in, in his epistles. My brethren, count it joy, various trials, that the testing of your faith is producing patience. But let, 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 let. Don't keep anguishing over your trials. Present them to God and then let the peace of God come upon you. Present them to God with thanksgiving. Philippians 3, verse 6 and 7. And if God takes them away, fine. If he doesn't take them away, fine. Know that he's using everything that's happening to you. None of it is going to waste. Let patience have its perfect, there's that word again, work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Yeshua said that we're supposed to carry our cross daily. Luke 9, 23. The life of a saint, the life of the called out ones, it's supposed to be, yes, it's supposed to be abundantly good. And uh, it's supposed to be wonderful in a lot of ways, but also it's supposed to also have a lot of trials because that's what's perfecting us. It's part of the program of perfection. Please get that. Now we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12. Paul had approached God with something that was really bugging him. He called it the thorn in the flesh. He prayed and prayed, never left him whatever it was, some physical ailment or pain or disease or, uh, or someone attacking him all the time. I don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. He doesn't tell us. But let's read what he says about that. You're gonna, and, and Paul was not going to have this taken away. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. I actually have a whole sermon on this verse, that when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He is strong. And he said to me, my grace, God said to me, Paul says, I went three times to God. Please, can you take this away? And three times, God, God finally, after the third time, comes back and says, my grace, my favor is sufficient for you, for my, my strength I'm trying to put my strength into you, Paul. I'm trying to put my character into you. I'm trying to put my righteousness and my perfection into you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Because in weakness, we come before God and we activate all of that goodness from God lives moves. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities 
that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. Are you there yet? <laughs> Start. Start practicing this. I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs. We need some money to buy this, to pay for that, to pay for this bill. In persecutions, I take pleasure in being attacked for what I believe unjustly. I take pleasure in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And he's strong how? In God's strength. In verse 9 again, remember, my strength is made perfect in weakness. That word perfect, made perfect, it's the same Greek word teleo again, 5048. It's 5048, that's the right number, not the one I gave earlier. Made complete, finished, perfect, mature, perfect. Peter says again that trials are to be preferred to gold. That's 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7. So I'm hoping that you're seeing suffering's not so bad. Pain's not so bad. As long as you keep committing it to God, as long as you keep presenting it to Him with thanksgiving, Philippians 3, 6, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and then the peace of God will come upon you that you can't even explain. Are you starting to see it? This is why we suffer. This is why we have temptations. This is why our life is the way it is. God's aware of all of it. He's building something very beautiful in this, in this first calling, this first resurrection, these first fruits team. It's beautiful. We still get down, though, when we have an accident that wonder why God let that accident happen, especially if it wasn't our fault. Or we get persecuted and we're trying to do something for Christ. Well, understand, it's all part of the program. Now, Christ and God are now perfecting us because he can declare the end from the beginning. So Hebrews 10, 14 says, before by one offering, Christ, one offering, he's not going to keep dying for you. Did it one time. That one time is going to cover you forever and ever. You need to get that. Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering, he has, past tense, perfected, past tense, forever, those who are being sanctified. Forever. So who perfects us? He has perfected us forever. So God's very good at completing what he starts. And what he works on will come out every time perfect including you. Perfect. Every time. Scripture tells us we are His workmanship. And He's really good at looking at His workmanship and saying it's very good, like He did on the sixth day. Now, why do we struggle with Hebrews 10, 14, that we have been perfected? It's because we look at ourselves and say, oh no, I haven't been. I still sin. I still am tempted by things I shouldn't be tempted by. The temptation's not the sin. There's a devil out there putting temptations in front of you. Sometimes you put temptations in front of yourself by yourself. But the temptation's not the sin. Giving in to it, being too long with it, that becomes the sin. It doesn't change the fact that your failures and your falling shorts doesn't change the fact that God already sees you as having been perfected. Are you getting that? I hope so. So, why do we fail so much? Why do we fail so much in terms of doing the things of God? And I want to be sure we really, really, really get this. If I asked you to describe your heart, how would you describe it? Many of you would say, well, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart a man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So that's the way my heart is, you might say to me. And I might say, which heart are you describing? Because scripture is now clear, we have two hearts. The one that's desperately wicked that we were born with, 
Remember that when Adam and Eve left the garden, they took with them all humanity with them in their seed, in their body. And God now is calling back individuals back to the garden, if you will. But we've all been cut off from God until God called us back, until God then offered his grace over us. But this evil heart in us is the heart of human nature, carnal nature. It Romans 8, verse 5 and Verses 5 to 8 says it cannot please God. Says it can't obey Him. It can't do God's law. It just can't. But then God gives us a new heart when we repent. When we come to Yeshua. David in his prayer of repentance says, Father, he says, God, create in me, O God. O Lord, O God, create in me a clean heart. It's God's creation. The new creation is not something you create. There's only one creator. There's only one savior. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. So this heart's a heart that God gave David. But now Galatians 5 and Romans 7 tells us that there are these two natures that fight each other all the time. These two natures. We don't do what we want to do. When we listen to the old nature, we sometimes give in to it. It's, it's, and, and this is why we still sin, because we have two natures. And the one that we feed, the one we listen to, the one that we spend time with, is the one that comes out on top. So Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17 says, So I say, live by the Spirit. Go by that new nature. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, of the flesh, the carnal nature, the old man. Different terminology, meaning the old way, the way we were. Verse 17, for the sinful nature desires what's contrary to the spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict. They war against each other. They're in conflict with each other. So you don't do the things that you want. We have to have faith in this heart from God, this righteousness from God, even though we don't see the perfection of God all the time in our life yet. Remember faith. What is faith? It's the evidence of things not seen yet, not seen. And so sure, you can look at yourself and say, I, I, I just don't see that perfection of God in me yet. In spite of my troubles, in spite of my temptations I've overcome, whatever. Remember, faith is the evidence of things not seen yet. So we don't see it yet, but we will someday. And the one who's going to perfect us is not you, but Christ in us. Now, Colossians 1, 28, 29 says exactly that. We have to get this into our heads. Him, Christ, we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present everyone... Perfect. There's that word again. How does, how does that happen? In Christ Jesus. Being in him. It's easy to understand how he's in us by the Holy Spirit. But we are also in him by that same spirit. We're part of his body. It's not just the corporate church that's part of his body. It's the We are members individually of Christ we're in him, and to this end I labor striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. Notice, after God's own holiness is given to us, to God's own righteousness is given to us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, to him who, who knew no sin will take all our sin, that I may give you God's righteousness. And having him in us, Christ is what finishes us, perfects us. God's plan for us. He is the one who's going to finish it. In uh, Philippians 1, verse 6, Philippians 1, verse 6, he says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, it's a good work, he's begun it, it's not finished yet, will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ, when he returns, It'll be totally complete at that point. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. So sometimes I know I look at myself and I say, man alive, I've been seeking God all my life. From the time I was a child, I'm coming up to 70 before you know it. How come I'm not 
better than I'm at. He's, well, that's his job. He's going to complete it. My job is to seek him. My job is to get glued to him. My God is to go in prayer to him all the time. My, my, job is to, my job is to have him fill me. My job is to do what he did in Paul, that he works mightily in us. Now, sometimes people will read Philippians 2.12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Say, aha, there you go, Philip, you're wrong. It's something I've got to do. Well, keep reading. Verse 13, that's not the end of the sentence. Verse 13 says, for it is God who works in you both to want to do, the will to do, and to do. For it's God. So make sure that you bring it to completion, the salvation. Take it seriously with fear and trembling. Understand what a high calling. And God doesn't take lightly someone who treats his high calling with disrespect. Just go back and read Matthew 22 and you'll see what he, he's not happy with that. So please, we've got to turn to him. We have one Savior. Work out your own salvation. I have one Savior. It's not me. I don't believe in do-it-yourself salvation, guys. So if you're thinking that that means you're supposed to work out and be, make yourself saved, you're misunderstanding it. I need to be very, very clear, though. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11 says, If we continue the unrighteous life as a way of life, I don't mean stumbles, as a way of life, we shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Start reading it there. Don't be deceived. Then he lists a whole bunch of sinful types of people and actions and sins. And then he ends verse 10 to say, nor swindlers, all these types of sins are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. If you see yourself in there, you've got to repent deeply. You've got to turn to God. You've got to say, I, 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 I'm having trouble with this or that. And I, 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 I know Christ can do all things. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Yeshua, please, please, I don't want to be this way anymore. Then you tell him what, what you're fighting and hand it over to him. He can do it. Okay, these guys won't inherit the kingdom of God if they keep going that way. But then look at the encouragement from verse 11. Such were some of you. Were. Past tense. But you were washed. You were sanctified, means set apart for holy use. You were justified, which means declared righteous. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the, and, and in the spirit of our, that's why you need the Holy Spirit, and in the spirit of our God. Such were some of you. If you go through the list of sins in there, several in there are ones that man will tell you you'll never be able to get rid of. They're permanent. And yet he says such were some of you, alcoholics, drunkards, it's one example. Others in there, such were some of you by the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ living in you. Nothing that they can't overcome inside of you. Nothing. And you accept the fact that you're a new creation. And you accept the fact others in the body are new creations. Accept them in the body. All I know is Yeshua can make the most perf imperfect of souls perfect. By the time he's done working with you. Now, again, so why are we missing this joy of salvation? I want to make sure we go into this and get the joy of salvation back. Too many of you are feeling discouraged and down and you're not going to ever make it. And every time you stumble in sin, you feel like you've been cut off from God. Once you're a child of God, God doesn't throw his kids out unless they choose to not have anything to do with God and walk away from him, spit in his face and all of that. Okay, we'll, we can read that later in Hebrews 10 maybe have time. But in Romans 7 verses 18 to 25, Paul explains, as we've covered many times, he says, I know that in my flesh nothing good dwells. The Holy Spirit's there, but that's not part of my flesh. He says, all I know is I want to do good. Look at verse 18 and 19. I want to do good, but I keep on doing the things I don't want to do. That's not the real me anymore, doing the bad things. It's the old me doing the bad things. And that doesn't count. He says, that's the old me. It's sin that dwells in me. 
I find then a law, verse 21, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. I love God's law. I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, the new nature. But I see another law, the old nature. He's, what he's talking about, in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Warring, just like Galatians said, these two contrary to each other. Bringing me, Paul, an apostle for over two decades by the time he wrote this, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. I still have that carnal nature. Now there were no chapter breaks. He says, now, the context, I as an apostle, Still stumbling in sin. I know you guys still stumble in sin too, he's saying. But, next verse, there, Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The context is even those of us still stumbling in sin, as we stumble in sin, we're not being condemned. There's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That last half of that sentence is not in the modern translations. But Romans 8, verse 3 and 4 still mention the same thing, that you've got to quit walking according to the flesh. Walking according to the flesh is not the same as stumbling. Stumbles means you want to do the right thing, but, oh, I had a weak moment and I... Whatever. Gossiped. I lied. Broke the Sabbath. Lusted. Gave in to lust. Committed fornication. If you're in Christ, that's a stumble. It's not a way of life. Now, if you're doing that every day, day in and day out, that is a way of life. You gotta, you're in big trouble. you got to repent of that. But if you find that some things you stumble in here and there, you're not condemned for it. There is now no condemnation. You've got to believe that. And remember, the Holy Spirit makes you a child of God. Those who are led by the Holy Spirit are children of God. Those who have the Holy Spirit have his nature, his divine nature, his seed. Peter said, we read that earlier. You're now a child of God. People don't, I, some people do, God doesn't take his children and throw them out because they stumbled. There's a verse, by the way, it's coming to me now in Jude 24. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, Jude 24, so we need to even come to God as I'm stumbling too often in this or that. The we, even we who stumble, still in sin, like Paul, but who have the Holy Spirit and no longer condemned, you are God's child. You are God's child. God doesn't kick you out of the family because you stumble. You know this. You know this, I think. But many of you still act like every time you sin, you're condemned, you're written off, you're thrown out of the family, and you're separated from God. No, no, no. You're not separated from God. Not in the New Covenant. I'm going to read later on, Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Once you're in Christ. In the Old Covenant, yeah, your sins will separate you from God. So you feel separated from His grace or thrown out of His family, but that's terrible misunderstanding. In the New Covenant, we remain His child under grace. And we come to Him in a heartfelt repentance that I stumbled horribly. Horribly. I need your forgiveness. I need your strength so I don't keep doing it. When we accepted Jesus Christ's death for our sins, it was for all of our sins. He died once. He's not going to keep dying for every time we sin. When he died once and all our sins are forgiven in that one offering, remember Hebrews 10, 14, by one offering, he has perfected forever. And yet we still stumble. He has perfected forever. Are you getting it? And I hope you heard me earlier too. I'm not, see, I'm not teaching 
you know, uh, once saved, always saved. I'm not teaching that once you accept the name of Jesus Christ, you can do whatever you want and be in the kingdom. I've just read you a few verses that says, no, you can't. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. And, and 1 Corinthians 6, we know the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. We just read all that. So don't fear that I'm teaching that you can do whatever you want. I'm not. I'm teaching that when you become a child of God with God's Holy Spirit and you sin, you don't step away from grace. In fact, you need more grace than more than ever. Grace upon grace, wave upon wave. In one of the chapters in Romans, it talks about that this grace is, we need to talk about grace. Let me focus on it. But when we sin after we become a child of God, we still have to confess and repent of that sin. But we're no longer under the eternal death penalty. We have, we're going to be in the first resurrection, and those in the first resurrection do not have to fear the second death. Revelation 20 around verse 4 or 5 says, or 6, <laughs> Revelation 20. But upon, that's what happens when you don't have them in your notes. I don't have the whole Bible memorized. I'm trying. But upon confession and repentance, no more con condemnation. Separation from sins. Our sins prior to accepting Christ did separate us from God, like Isaiah 59.2 says. That's the Old Covenant. That's before we accepted Christ. But Christ took that separation for us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember? He took that separation from us once we accept him for forever and ever. We're not going to be separated from Father. I want to give a sermon that goes in depth about when a believer sins. We'll cover this again, but in much more detail. Now as a child of God, we stumble in sin. We have to confess and repent. We're never con condemned again. We never fall out of grace again. We don't have to be separated ever again. It's different now. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Forever! You're always God's child. There are sins I've committed, sins you've committed, that we look at ourselves and we think, how can I even be in the kingdom? That's God's grace. For by grace you have been saved. Not of works, that you start boasting. By grace. Now, you will always be God's child unless you spit in his face and walk away from him. On your own, go back and read Hebrews 10. Verses 26 to 31, nothing can separate you now. Let's read that, Romans 8, 38, 39. Romans 8, 38 and 39. In the Old Covenant, the Old, Old, Old Testament, when you sin, that separates you from God. Romans 8, 38, 39, now you're a child of God. Now you have his Holy Spirit. You have his divine nature. You have Christ inside of you. I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities or powers or things present, or things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So cheer up, beloved child of God. Even when you mess up, he still loves you, probably even more so. Just like you do your child who makes mistakes, you see them as a baby smearing food all over their mouth and you see them pooping their pants and not running soon enough to the bathroom and you, you try to bring that up. You don't get rid of them. You love them. We now, okay, so understand what I'm saying here now, please. Besides all that, remember, we have the Holy Spirit which seals us, which guarantees it, which locks it down. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed 
with the Holy Spirit of promise, the guarantee, the guarantee, the down payment, the earnest, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. The guarantee. You have the Holy Spirit which guarantees you're there. Paul, again, who admitted in Romans 7 that he still kept sinning, now says there's no condemnation. We're not separated. We're not condemned. Please get that. When we accept Christ, that death penalty for our sins is permanent, forever, removed. He's not going to die more than once. He died once. That once covers all sin for all time. 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says he continues to cleanse. He cleanses. It's an ongoing action. He cleansed, yeah, the first time he went to him, but he continues to cleanse as we sin. He continues to cleanse as we sin, okay? We're now in his body. And I believe Yeshua's word. We have passed from death to life. No more condemnation or judgment. Look at John 5, 24. This is Yeshua himself talking. Verily I say unto you, he that hears my word and believes on him who sent me has everlasting life. If you believe on him and believes on him who sent you and God the Father has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation. Can you believe that? Or do you keep refusing it? Believe it. It's beautiful. Has eternal life, shall not come to condemnation, has passed from death to life. I love it. I hope you love it. So when is this perfection finally consummated? Finally complete, complete. We've had hints already until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul does say in Philippians 3, Philippians 3, verse 14, 13, 14, not that I've already attained that perfection, but I press on. So Paul was looking at the way he was right now, but God's looking at the way he sees the end from the beginning. So God can say, yes, you've been perfected, has perfected, because I'm going to do it. I always keep my word. But ultimately, we're told that the final perfection in the final sense is at the resurrection, when all the saints together, when all the saints together, come together. Hebrews 12, 23 states that we come to the church of the firstborn in heaven to the spirits of just men made perfect, to righteous men made perfect. So they're made perfect. They didn't attain perfection on their own. They didn't work out their own perfection. No, no, no. They were made perfect. They were gifted perfection. They were given it. And so when will this perfection on all the saints, on the rest of us? I love Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, these were commended for their faith, and yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us. They're made perfect, but they haven't received it yet. God had planned something better for us that only together with us would they be made perfect. All of God's children who have God's Holy Spirit are going to be perfected together. And so how does that happen? Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, seventh angel is the last trump, folks, okay? When he's about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. Same word as perfected, matured, completed. Same word. The Greek word teleo all over again. The mystery of God would be finished or perfected as he declared to his servants, the prophets. So at that seventh trump, we know from 1 Thessalonians that the dead in Christ rise first, and then those of us who remain shall be resurrected, changed to spirit, immortal spirit, and will rise up to meet them in the clouds and be with Christ forever. And we're all going to be there together. I mean, everybody from Abel to the last person who has God's Holy Spirit that God calls. We're going to see Ruth. We're going to see Rahab. We're going to see Mary Magdalene, Sarah. We're going to see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Peter, and Sarah. And we're going to see Rachel. We're going to see the 12 apostles, and Paul, Timothy, Apollos, Daniel, David. We're going to be there with them, all being perfected in the final sense 
at the same time. What a heart God has. What a, what a joyful, what a joyful time that's going to be. And maybe, just maybe at the seven trump, you might hear a guy down there, me, as I see myself being changed to spirit, an angel coming down to collect me, because I don't know how to use all these controls for spirit body yet. So an angel is say, hey, don't touch anything. We don't want you crashing into Mars. Probably not call it Mars, though. It's a pagan name. Uh, I'm sure they'll rename all the planets. But anyway, my point is, you might hear me say, finished! Would you join me? I'd like to be there with you. I'd like you to be there with me. I'd like to share this moment with you. Finished. All done. Jude 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. It came to me while I was talking earlier. Don't justify your stumblings. Even stumblings can be get less and less. Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, Yeshua, thank you. Thank you. What a team God's creating. What a headed by God the Father supreme, by Yeshua, King of kings, Lord of lords, and our Savior and Master, our husband. You'll be there with all the big names. You'll be there with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, David and the apostles. God's perfect team will include you. You'll have a new name. He'll tell you what your job is, what, what you're supposed to be getting ready for. We'll come to the wedding supper. Your name is there, reserved a place. It's a reserved place for you for the wedding supper. You, perfect, spotless, blameless, wrinkle-free you. Some of us are getting wrinkles. You know, as we get older into our 60s and 70s, our neck and our, you know, our elbows and around our arms, it starts getting old, wrinkly. We lose a lot of our muscle core, flex your muscles and nothing moves. <laughs> That's all going to change. Wrinkle-free you. No spot, no wrinkle. It doesn't mean that kind of wrinkle. It means spiritual wrinkles, but I can have fun with it, can I? 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Keep in mind that God has a perfect dream for you, that he's going to be there, he's going to attain it with you, for you, being part of the team, being part of the team where all of them, including you, have a part. Each one has a part in that beautiful kingdom of God because he covers us all with his perfection, and you're going to love the job he gives you but 1 John 3, 1 and 2, Behold, the, uh, the manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Beloved, now are we children of God. He's not going to kick you out. He's not going to condemn you. Once you're a child of God, now are we children of God. Tell him you're sorry. Repent. Turn back around. If you have to turn around, get back on the path. He will give you the biggest hug like the father in the prodigal son story. He ran out to greet him, hugged him, gave him his best robe, gave him a feast, gave him a ring on his finger, turban on his head, sandals on his feet. Loved seeing his son who had died and now was alive again, died spiritually. You might feel like you're dying spiritually at times. God runs out to you too. More joy in heaven over you. And once you're there, a child of God, he's not going to kick you out. We started. Well, let's finish what it says here. 1 John 3, verse 2. Now are we children of God, though we don't know what we're exactly what we'll be just yet. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. What's he like? Oh, he's love, and he's joy, and he's peace, and he's all the fruit of the Spirit. But he's also perfect. Perfect! We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
I can't wait to meet Abba, my dear father, my daddy. We shall see him. And he's going to be very happy to see you and me. Verse 2 says, we shall be like him. He'll be thrilled to meet you face to face. He'll have his moments with you, I'm sure. One on one. You will be at that time just like him, just like Jesus, just like him. But our perfection is by being in Christ, in, in God. Colossians 3, 3 and 4. So I look forward to this reunion, don't you? I, I, I do. I re look forward to it. And every single one of us, including you, at that time will be seen as perfect, mature, complete. Godspeed that day. Oh, God in heaven, our great Father. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. We look up to you and just thank you so much for everything you are and have done for us. Continue to do for us. What an awesome God you are, dear God. Someday we'll see you. My eyes open because we're going to see you and be just like you because of what Yeshua is doing inside of us, your son, who lived a perfect life. Come live mightily in all of us, dear Jesus. Please come live mightily in us. Help us follow your lead better. Help us stumble less. To him who's able to keep you from stumbling, keep me from stumbling. Keep us all who are hearing this. Let us rejoice that we're in you. We have to repent when we stumble in sin. But we're not separated anymore. We're not cast out anymore. We don't fall out of grace. In fact, we need more grace than ever. Dismiss us now, dear Father. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Put your divine protection around us and your, and your angels around us. We thank you and we praise you. In Yeshua's mighty name, Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, Lion of Judah, in your name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.